This is lesson four of 24. So if you're just joining us, you haven't missed many lessons. You can go back and hear the previous three lessons. So we're just getting started. But lesson four is titled The Prince of Pride. Many of you probably already figured out who this is going to be about. Um, but I'm going to go into some detail. I'm going to go into some Bible verses that support the positions that we know God has shared with us in regards to Satan and the devil and the things that he does to deceive, as well as the person that he is. I'm Sierra Hernandez. I'm your presenter this morning. In 2001, there was a comedy made in Australia about Steve, a runaway lawyer who sued God. His sailboat was struck by lightning, and the insurance company refused to pay for the claim because it was an act of God. So Steve decided if it's an act of God, he would file suit against God and company, including the 55 Christian churches that were in the city. During the trial in this movie, one minister spoke out saying, I believe the expression an act of God is wrongly used. God was not responsible for the accident. It should have been called an act of the devil. I haven't seen the movie, but according to the Bible, the minister was absolutely correct. Evil is not an act of God ever. But God definitely gets the blame. There is biblical truth in placing the blame on the devil who is responsible for all the accidents, the strife, all the problems that confront mankind. As we watch the news, we quickly become aware of the evil force that is acting upon this world. Everywhere we look, we see evidence of tragedies, sorrow, suffering, and death. We often hear, why did God let that happen? How, could he, how come he didn't stop it? People are always blaming God and wondering why God isn't jumping in and taking care of every situation, knowing he has the capability to. While God is loving and he's kind, there is another work, power at work in this world that is bringing the tragedy and the sickness and the death to each individual. No one escapes that. The Bible tells us how evil began. There is no earthly source for a logical explanation of evil apart from God's word. The Bible puts the finger on the guilty party, and it is Satan. Sin began with one angel in heaven. He was the covering cherubs on, over God's throne. He carried out God's orders to the universe and the inhabitants of the other worlds, but... He became jealous of Jesus, and he coveted God's throne. He craved worship as God received. Then Revelation 12, 7 through 9 tells us there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was any place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon... The serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9. Notice how the dragon, or the devil, is introduced in Revelation 12, verses 3 and 4. It says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail drew one-third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. In prophecy, stars represent angels. Evidently, one-third of God's angels sided with Satan. Lucifer, in the Old Testament, is described as the king of Tyre. You see in Ezekiel 28, 12 through 14, it says, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom 
and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. You were the anointed cherub who covers. You were the, in the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the fiery stones. Satan was created perfect and stood as the highest exalted angel in heaven. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Corrupted, your, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. This gorgeous, exalted angel became lost due to his ego. He coveted the glory and the homage due to God alone. He was power hungry. He had the boldness to challenge his creator God for rulership of the entire universe. Listen carefully to Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the most high. As these arrogant words spilled forth from Lucifer's lips, the perfect love and harmony of heaven was shattered. Lucifer began to spread the spirit of discontent, discontentment among all the other angels. Slowly but surely, he undermined God's love and justice. Why didn't God just simply eliminate Satan and the angels who sided with him? Had God zapped Satan and his angels out of existence at that time, all his angels, the other angels, and the inhabitants of other worlds would have followed him out of fear. Satan had challenged God's laws and justice, but God didn't create these laws to show that he was the boss and he was in charge. That's not God's government because we've said before, God is love. He made them to protect the beings that he created, to ensure peace and happiness. His laws are like stoplights and speed limit signs, all planned for our safety and our well-being. But Lucifer, the most honored angel, thought he could run the universe better than God, his creator. So God decided to let Satan and evil play out within the universe so every being would understand the consequences of sin. God gave the angels a choice, and one-third of them chose Satan. Can you imagine? These angels were in heaven. They were with God. They knew God. They experienced God's love, and yet they chose to follow Satan. They allowed themselves to be deceived by the greatest deceiver and they chose to follow him. One of the greatest gifts God gives his creation is freedom to choose. He doesn't want robots forced to love him. He only accepts worship in love. God knows that our only happiness lies in becoming total loving creatures, just as he is. You remember, we were made in his image. How did that battle against God get from heaven, which is where it began, to earth? Earth became the battleground upon which the great controversy between good and evil would play out before the entire universe. Satan would demonstrate his kind of government and how he would run the world. And it would be dramatized before the entire universe. In fact, 1 Corinthians 4, 9 tells us that our world is a spectacle to the universe, both to angels and to men. But why earth? Why did our planet have to become the stage? Our earth 
had just come from the hand of the creator. It was created new in all its splendor and perfection, beautiful beyond description. A new creation, humans were here and made in God's image. All the other worlds and angels had observed the war in heaven. Satan didn't attempt to invade and control an established planet with millions of loyal, God-loving inhabitants. Rather, he would attempt to seize a newly created planet with newly created humans who had no history in the universe. Had God told Adam and Eve about the war in heaven, and did he instruct them to avoid Satan? Because you recall, they walked with God daily. Adam and Eve were created perfect, but they were not placed beyond the capability and possibility of doing wrong. They were free to choose to be loyal to God and to obey him. He explained in Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17, the rule. Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. That must have seemed like a reasonable request. Stay away from the tree, you'll surely die. Don't eat of the fruit. That was something seemed relatively easy to follow. Just stay away from the tree. But we are vulnerable when we feel secure. Satan used his supernatural, psychic power to deceive Eve. Satan rarely works openly. He does everything in secret, and he does it in a very deceptive way. He is very deceitful, and he uses governments, organizations, people, or even, in this case, a serpent. Here's what Paul advised. In Ephesians 6, 13, he said, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may not be that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Eve was deceived. She never suspected that the words from a talking snake came from Satan, yet she was fascinated and actually engaged in conversation with it. Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? This should be a warning not to go to any place that you should not go to and engage in conversation only to be slightly deceived but deceived. We have to be careful in our everyday lives. When we question something that in the back of our mind we know we shouldn't go to or do. But, you know, curiosity gets the best of us. And people will tend to explore things just out of curiosity. And that is not a good thing because you put yourself in the path that Satan can then take hold of. You have to remember, she had not yet learned fear. Imagine living in a perfect place. You wouldn't have to be fearful of anything. You wouldn't have learned that emotion. You didn't need fear. And yet, she did not even know what a lie was. No one had lied to her. She spoke every day with God. So she was unaware of fear or lying. She was in this perfect place. So she engaged in conversation. Genesis 3, verses 2 through 4. We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, 
you will not surely die. It must have crossed her mind that the snake was saying something different from what God had said. Because God had told her, you shall surely die. There was already a contradiction here. It must have confused her. This is the same test for us. Who will you trust and obey? You see how Satan twists God's word. Here we see Satan for the first time bringing in the concept of immortality. Satan would love for people to think immortality happens when you're on this earth and the minute you die. And that is not what the Bible says. But here is the first time he said, you shall not surely die. He was letting her know, you can eat it, you won't die. Then the clincher, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan suggested that God was unfair and he was holding back something good from her. This knowledge of good and evil. That, that that's something that she might want to know too, and God was not allowing her to know it by not letting her eat from that tree. To be like God had been Satan's consuming desire and his downfall. Now, it sounded good to Eve too. An impetuous moment, she fell for Satan's lie. How often in our lives have we fallen for Satan's lies? only to find out later that you now know it came from Satan. You know that the deceiver has had a part in what has happened in your life. Through Adam and Eve's sin, Satan hijacked the newborn world. From that moment on, Satan laid down his claim to the title, Prince of this World, the ruler of a planet in rebellion. Adam and Eve were banished from the garden. And sure enough, things began to die. We all know the story. Satan is the one who brought sin and suffering to this planet and who has been causing all the sin and suffering ever since. Jesus unmasked Satan during his life on earth. He called out what evil was. He called out Satan and the deceitfulness of Satan. John 8 44, Jesus said, the devil was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. That's pretty straightforward. I don't think you have to wonder or divert yourself from that definition. It's pretty straightforward who Satan is, what he does, what he causes, and we're living in a world and we're seeing the repercussions of Satan having a devastating effect on our world. How powerful and effective are Satan's temptations and strategies? The world is in Satan's grip, and most of us don't even give Satan a thought, which allows him to effectively operate behind the scenes in our lives. Always remember that he convinced one-third of God's holy angels to rebel with him. Revelation 12, verses 3 through 9. He caused all but eight people in the world to be lost in Noah's day. 1 Peter 3.20. Almost the entire world will follow him. And Matthew 7.14 and 22 verse 14 says that few will be saved. That's a heartbreaking biblical prediction. The path we know is straight and narrow, but only for a few. Only a few will accept the challenge of walking down a straight and narrow path that is very different from the world. There's very few that will say, I'm not going to be like the rest of the people in the world just to get along, just to not stand out. God asks us 
to stand out. We need to represent who he is in his character. We were built in his image. I keep going back to that. God created us to be like him. We fall so far away from that when we try to be like the world instead of like God. We fall far away from who we were created to be. And God is calling us back to be who he created us to be. And we can only do that with God at the center of our lives. Satan's success rate is so astoundingly high that it seems almost unbelievable. The idea that Satan is only a myth, an influence, that, leaves, that will leave you totally unprepared to confront how intelligent he actually is and the things that he's been planning. We are absolutely no match for Satan. I will tell you, there's, there's people in my family that don't believe Satan exists and there's no devil. And that is such a scary, scary thing. Because if you don't think he's there, then everything he's doing, you won't even be aware that he's doing them. If you are on the lookout and you're aware that he is out and working evil, then you would be more cautious when things are said to you or people invite you into situations that could be uncomfortable. You could avoid them and not put yourself in that situation. There's so many things that if you were aware how active Satan was in this world that you could prepare for, but to be unaware that he even exists, that he's doing stuff all day long to disrupt your life and take you further away from God is a scary position to be in. Didn't we just watch him shut down every church in America with no protest from any denomination? Didn't we watch a whole group of people burn a pile of Bibles in Portland? Didn't we stand back and watch the wiles of Satan? Since Satan's angels can't take the form of men, how do we know that those promoting the looting and burning aren't being led by Satan's angels in the form of men. This nation was built on the foundation of Christian principles. I say, how dare we do things to blaspheme God? We are a nation that was built on the foundation of those principles that God has instilled in us. And look how far we've gone away. Look at the legislation that's been passed in our own government in the United States of America that goes completely contrary to God's word, direct, directly against what we believe. And those laws are passed in a government that we are under. The world map shows the top 50 countries where Christian persecution is the worst. The map is filling up with countries that openly persecute Christians, and we will not be immune. I have a map up on the screen that shows all those dark colored countries, and in those, those are the top 50 countries where Christians are being persecuted. How much time before the United States gets colored on that map? We are seeing Christians starting to be persecuted. If you speak up and you say anything that's a strong foundation of a biblical principle, you are called out. And they're even, even writing laws that are starting to persecute you, to have you fined and put in prison for saying things that are biblical. That freedom of speech only seems to work one way in the United States. And that is the way of whoever is leading and controlling the government. And Satan has a big hand in that. We can see the laws being passed and what's happening to our nation that used to be a fairly safe place to live. I'll grant you that it is safer than most other countries in the world, but it's only a matter of time. Satan knows his time is short. He knows God's plan and he knows God's coming back to get his people. So he's trying to win as many souls away from Christ as he can. And he's instilling all these crazy ideas that seem to pop up in the news and pop up in legislation that we're just astounded by. Prophecy says it will make an image to the beast and breathe life into it. But first it will fall under the control of Satan. Christianity will be replaced in our land. 
Revelation 12, 12 says words of warning that we all should remember. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath because he knows his time is short. Revelation 12, 12. Again, very straightforward, easy to understand words that we are told in prophecy is going to happen. And he, we all are visibly seeing that in the day and time that we're living in. And Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We dare not leave our house in the morning without prayer. Prayer is protection. We can't fight Satan. We are powerless to do it. But God can, and he'll do it on our behalf. And we should pray every morning before our feet hit the floor. We should be on our knees asking God to please surround us with his angels, protect us, fill us with the Holy Spirit, and allow us to walk in his light. We cannot battle against Satan without God. And I wouldn't start my day without him because Satan will find a door to enter. When is the devil the most dangerous? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Matthew 7, 15. Satan is the most dangerous when he poses as a spiritual being working inside the church. Where else would you expect Satan to be? He's not out in the world because he's already got the world. What he wants to do is disrupt the churches. He wants to come in and create division in churches. He wants to divide us up, have us fight, have us disagree, have us be mad and angry and leave the church. Then Satan wins. He got just what he wanted, and he did it just the way he expected it to be done. We have to be very careful when we start to see division in our church, we talk a lot about unity. As a unified body, Satan can't break through the, the walls. The minute we have division, Satan walks right in the door and he says, good, I have an audience now. So we have to be very careful when we start to see things happen in the church. We need to unify. We need to go back to what God says. We need to close the door to that. We need to stop the infighting or the disagreements. We need to address those, clean them up, and move forward on the same page because we're all here for one reason. Every one of us wants to be in heaven for an eternity, and we want everyone in here to go with us. We love our brothers and sisters. We're brothers and sisters here on this earth, and we will be brothers and sisters in eternity, and it's a beautiful thing. But we can't let division divide us up and separate us. So we have to beware of false prophets that enter the church. Remember, we test everything by Isaiah 8.20. If they speak not according to the word, there is no truth in them. Test every doctrine and every belief. Most people never test because they've never been raised that way. So they just believe it if they hear it. They figure you're smarter than me. You study the Bible. I'll just believe whatever you say. But I say to you, no matter who it is that's standing up here, that's standing before you, that you should test it. You should go home and say, I'm going to go back and look that up. I want to make sure that's, that's the way God intended it. So we want you to follow God's word over following traditions. How did Jesus fight the assaults of the devil? None of us will ever be attacked as badly as Jesus was when he was on this earth. Satan knew he had a chance to live forever if he could break Jesus. So what did Jesus do? Matthew, Matthew chapter 4 tells us that Jesus faced Satan's temptations head on. After fasting for 40 days and nights, Jesus was hungry. 
So Satan approached him and said, If you really are God's son, tell these stones to become bread. Matthew 5, 4 says that Jesus replied, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If you really are the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give the angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up lest at any time you should dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said, All these things I will give you if thou will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Get away from me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. What would our lives be like if we simply learned to say, Get away, Satan? Or if we responded to things and say, It is written. Do we know the Bible? Do we know God's word well enough to know that God wrote about that? Could we say it is written that God said, and then finish that sentence? Because not knowing God's word, we are vulnerable to believing what somebody else is saying. We have to be aware that it is written, and it is written for us to learn, to know, to understand, and more importantly, to share with others. James 4, 7 tells us to submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from us. Satan cannot force our will. Our free will is a gift from God that nobody can take from us. Like Jesus, we need to be immersed in Scripture. Psalms 119.11 says, Your word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Satan knows that even one sin will keep us out of heaven. Have you ever noticed that all of us seem to have a sin that we excuse? There's one thing that we might make excuses for, thinking it's not quite that bad. But sin is sin. Something we know isn't good for us, but we indulge in it and excuse ourselves. Or who do you think is putting thoughts in your head that, well, it's okay. It's not so bad. It's just a little thing. I'm not lying. I'm not cheating and coveting and stealing and killing. I'm not doing those big bad sins. Uh, I'm pretty good. I follow all of God's commandments, but there might be a few things that I probably shouldn't do, but they're not as bad as the others. Do we not live in a world where we're always comparing? Do we not compare all the time? I'm not as bad as that person. I must be good because I'm not like them. We're always comparing and we set the standard based on other people around us. We don't set the standard based on what Jesus did when he walked this earth or God's word. So we have to be careful in this world where we're looking horizontally at each other and using those standards to judge whether we're good or good enough versus looking up. And comparing the standards of what God gave us and what Jesus did for us. To be safe, we must close every single door to Satan. Don't do things that cause us to forget that we're standing on holy ground wherever we are and whatever we're doing. When we have Christ with us, we are walking around as the temple of God. Our bodies are our temples now. We don't have... Uh, sanctuaries and temples that are physical anymore because God says he is with us. Satan is enemy number one. Isn't believing in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, uh, isn't that enough to save us? No. Simply believing Jesus, that Jesus saves us, is not enough. James 2.19 says, That even Satan and the demons believe, but are not saved. So anyone can believe. 
And that doesn't mean you're guaranteed to be saved. We also have to obey. As Adam and Eve believed and they did not obey. James 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Satan's deceptions are constant and they're devious. However, prophecy says that he's planning some unbelievable final deceptions to take this world captive before Jesus returns for us. Here are some of those. The theory of evolution. Satan has cultivated philosophies and theories that slander God as our creator. Colossians 2.8 says, look out. Perhaps there may be some man that will carry you off as his prey through the philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary things of the world, and not according to Christ. Secondly, independence from God's law. By subtle means, Satan's influence influences worldly thinking to make independence from God appear to be desirable. God's laws are slyly ridiculed by society as being very restrictive and outdated. They say they don't apply to our day and time. Have you heard that? Have you heard people who do follow the commandments and follow God being told, oh, that's old stuff. That was from the old days. It doesn't apply to us anymore. God doesn't know that our rules today should be a little bit altered. They should be altered to our lifetime, our culture, our day and time. And God created the earth from the beginning to the end. I think God knew the rules that we would need throughout history, regardless of the generation that you're living in. Satan inspires people to justify worldly, immoral acts that are forbidden by God. Drugs are even marketed to help remove guilt, guilty feelings from such acts. Satan is behind the idea of justifying right for wrong. He is, we, we have, I've heard many people tell me that why is the world so turned upside down? It seems like right is wrong and wrong is right. Well, yes, that's exactly how Satan wants it. Sin originates in our thoughts. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If we harbor sinful thoughts, in time we will act out on those. Constant exposure to movies, TV, video games conditions our brain to think like the world. Whatever you fill your brain with, that you will become. Those things will become the norm because you've normalized them by looking at them over and over and over again. So we have to be careful of what goes in our brains. Which is why Proverbs 4.23 tells us, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. America's entertainment conditions us to what is immoral, criminal, and violent. The long-term effect on the kids of today is frightening. They don't even realize what's being poured into them. I was listening to a program by Neil Nedley. Many of you may know him or follow him or have heard of him. And it is amazing how he dissects what's going on with the younger generation in regards to depression. It is because of the things going into their minds. The fact they have a cell phone in front of them constantly pouring music into their brain nonstop, videos. They watch funny things. They watch silly things. How many of the times they have their cell phone in their hand are they watching Christian programming, things that teach them about God or God's word. I, I'm sh assured that number is very, very low, if at all. But he was explaining what they have to do to deprogram a young person's depressed brain to get them out of the things that have been programmed into their brain because of the world they live in today. 
and it's amazing. If you get a chance, you can look him up and look up depression, and he has a whole program on it. He did an interview with John Bradshaw from It Is Written, and it was amazing to hear how much of our surroundings affect everything about who we are. We take it for granted, but it, it's real. It's a chemical adjustment that's going on in your brain. And we don't think about that because we can't see it. But it really is affecting this entire young generation that's growing up. Satan has some great dramas prepared to deceive the world. We see in Revelation 13, 13. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of man or men. Don't know what this is. But God sure has warned us about this. He is telling us that Satan is going to deceive the world with great wonders. Satan's powerful miracles will truly hijack the world. Satan will use his supernatural powers to deceive and destroy and make everyone think it is God doing it. For example... Matthew 24, 24 tells us, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. The elect are God's people who love him, but we're warned not to be deceived. 1 Timothy 4, 1 again warns us, For they are spirits of devils working miracles. Revelation 16, 14. These will be genuine miracles that will be happening on the earth. We tend to associate every miracle with God. When something happens, we're like, it's miraculous. God came through and God did this and God did that. But Satan, if he could deceive you and, and a miracle happens and you believe it came from God because that's what you think, then you will be deceived. We're already told that Satan can do miracles as well. These will be general, gen, genuine miracles. Don't be deceived as we're warned in Isaiah 8.20. Satan creates diseases and he can remove them. So signs of healing aren't necessarily from God. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. This is why I believe angel, evil angels are within the mobs when there's burning and looting going on in our nation. Don't underestimate what is really going on in these mass mobs. You see, angels can appear as men. We've seen it from miracles. We had a quick little story at our house Thursday night at the Bible study where Santos was sharing with us something that happened in Mexico, in Brazil. He's from Brazil. And he was telling us that uh, somebody needed rescuing because they were dying from this flood that was creeping up to the top of the roof. And the woman was desperate and her son finally got, somebody called her and he thought it was the firemen, and they got him in a boat, and they went and saved his mom. And when they got back, he went to go thank the fire station for the men in the boat. And he said, we didn't have anybody with the boat at all, and there are no men here that went out and rescued anyone. So he was sure those were angels representing, coming, looking like men that were doing God's work. So it does happen. It happens in our day and time. And don't you forget that Satan can do the same thing. He can have men in a mob crowd appear as men, and yet they are evil angels. So when we think, wow, I can't believe those evil people. Some of those aren't evil people. Those are actually evil angels. We have to not underestimate what Satan is capable of. There are also in our churches... Angels leading division among us. Satan's power and his ability is strong. So be alert, be watchful, resist Satan's efforts to mold our thinking, especially when we're seduced by the news. Beware. Then comes the granddaddy of all deceptions. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 14 and 15. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Can you imagine the world? 
The Jews have been getting ready for the Messiah. They've been planning to build another temple and being and, and a being that's going to come and say, hey, I'm here, I'm Jesus. He's going to look like Jesus. He's going to appear like Jesus. He's going to be in a form of a light surrounding him. He arrives in the city of Jerusalem. He starts healing the sick. He blesses people. He's saying, by the way, the Sabbath was changed to Sunday. His demons transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. The devil can give men power to work miracles. That's a scary thought. What we used to think only came from God, Satan has now found a way to turn it into something evil as a way to deceive us. So we have to be vigilant. The way to protect ourselves, the word of God. Always remember, if fire from heaven lands on praying people's heads who are speaking in tongues and they receive what appears to be the Holy Spirit, and they claim to be John, Peter, and Paul, and they start performing healings, don't you think the world would believe that? They wouldn't know better. It would appear as something that happened in the Bible years ago, and yet they've come back. They've come back to do God's work. That would be a deception of Satan. Here's the final real issue. The time has come when we cannot trust our senses and our feelings. When the counterfeit resembles the genuine so closely that our only safety is knowing God. We need to know God and we need to know his word. Isaiah 8.20 Whom on earth does the devil hate the most? And we should never forget this. In Revelation 12, verse 17, it says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's us. That's us, people. That's who Satan is most angry with. It's us because we keep the commandments of God and we follow God's word. We are God's people. If everything is going absolutely perfect in our lives, we should be a little nervous. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, And all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Satan hates God's people. And Satan will do whatever he can do to fool us. And we have to find a way to resist Satan. So what's the only way you can resist Satan? James 4, 7 through 9 tells us, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. When we surrender to Jesus Christ, we are perfectly safe. God walks with us in our trials. He doesn't keep us from them, but he walks with us through them. We are safe because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. And like David, who was hunted like an animal by King Saul, who wanted to kill him, we can say, in God have I put my trust. I will not fear what man can do to me. Psalm 56, 11. What will be the final fate of Satan? God says in Ezekiel 28, verses 16 and 18, I destroyed you, O covering cherub. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. Satan will be gone forever, along with sin and suffering. Amen? Speaking of Satan, the Bible says, Never shalt thou be any more. Ezekiel 28, 19. And Nahum 1, 9 assures us that affliction shall not rise up a second time. All of us have a choice on whose side we choose to be on. All of us have to decide who we believe, who we follow, who we trust, and who we obey. We will follow the resurrected power or the rebellious angel who who is condemned to die in hellfire. John 6.37 says, Whoever comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Jesus longs for us all to choose him. But he will not force us. Eternal life with Jesus is a choice, a choice that you will make personally. Our decision is a life and death matter. 
Choose wisely.